Hello, welcome you all again to the lecture series in political theory. This is the second part of uh, my lecture on Marxist theory of uh, class struggles, party and dictatorship of the proletariat. In the first part of the lecture that I, I uploaded last week, I addressed questions like what do you mean by class? Why do Marxists emphasize so much on classes and class struggles? What do they mean by terms such as class interest and class consciousness? What is it so specific that uh, Marx and Engels consider the proletariat as uh, the most revolutionary class? And is it necessary to have uh, a revolutionary proletariat party to ensure socialist revolution? What will happen to the class struggles in the intermediary phase of uh, dictatorship of the proletariat? When do classes disappear? Whether they disappear at all? All these questions I try to address in my first lecture. If you have not seen that, I request you to see that first part before you come to this second part. In this second part of the lecture, I am reading out certain passages from classical works of different Marxist thinkers so to substantiate or to elaborate what I have explained so far about class struggle, party and dictatorship. These passages will introduce you to different works of uh, Marxist thinkers and enables you to see yourselves what they have written about uh, these issues. But before I start reading these passages, uh, I have some advice uh, to my students. You know, teaching and learning through this medium of YouTube is something new to you and also to me. This experience is uh, different from classroom teaching experience. In the normal classroom teaching, once you enter the class, you will be tied to the classroom for about one hour. Your teacher insists that you listen to him or shouts at you if you are not concentrating. But in these video lectures, I am not there to discipline you. You need to discipline yourself. True Concentrating on video lecture continuously for, for about 45 minutes uh, to one hour is very difficult. So I suggest that uh, you try to concentrate continuously for 15 to 20 minutes, then take a break, relax for a while and then come back. Hmm? While watching the video, you also Keep watching the subtitles. If you have in any difficulty in understanding my pronunciation, you can watch the subtitles to understand that. 
make notes of what you understand okay that is another thing which i want you to do uh, if you couldn't follow or didn't follow rewind and watch again hmm? if you are comfortable use your earphones so that you concentrate better and avoid disturbing others at home if you didn't understand uh, uh, anything keep anything which i have uh, said in the lecture you are free to ask for clarification in the comment section it is not necessary that you should only like even if uh, you have queries uh, uh, you are free to ask this uh, address these questions and i will try to answer hope all this is okay with you uh, and now let us uh, uh, turn back to our business you know when we start with this basic thing okay about what classes are okay i try to give you the definition or meaning of what classes are according to marxis you know the famous passage from the communist manifesto where marx and engels wrote the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle freeman and slave patrician and plebeian lord and serf guildmaster and journeyman in a word oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another carried on an an uninterrupted now hidden now open fight a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes a beautiful passage which uh, we normally quote again and again to say that marxists emphasize on classes and class struggles yes but what exactly you mean by classes no there is so much written on classes and class struggles in the writings of uh, marx and engels uh, but uh, you don't find a precise definition anywhere eh, saying that these are classes but there are certain passages which uh, make us uh, lead to the understanding of uh, what marxists mean by classes okay so uh, you can see i told you that according to marx and engels eh, the classes are to be located in the mode of production mm -hmm. so you have many passages uh, uh, from marx and engels uh, emphasizing on the mode of production especially the relations of production eh, uh, within uh, every mode of production so for example i have read out uh, some passages uh, Oh, while at lecturing on historical materialism but here i quote one more passage from karl marx wage labor and capital in that he writes in the process of production human beings work not only upon nature but also upon one another they produce only by working together in a specified manner and reciprocally exchanging their activities in order to produce 
they enter into definite connections and relations to one another and only within these social connections and relations does their influence upon nature operate that is does production take place these relations these social relations between the producers and the conditions under which they exchange their activities and share in the total act of production will naturally vary according to the character of uh, the means of production so this is in an actual telling what all we said about the mode of production so in this mode of production apart from forces of production that means where the people as a whole interact with the nature while involving in production there is another component that is the relations of production so while interacting with the nature people come together and establish particular kind of uh, relations among themselves while involving in the act of production so this uh, uh, without involving in some kind of uh, uh, relations they cannot even enter into you know, production so these relations he says uh, uh, the thing vary according to the nature of uh, the means what kind of means you have at your disposal or, or at what stage of development you are there that will determine what kind of relations exist uh, among the people hmm? so whether uh, you are still in a primitive communist society or in a slave society or a feudal society or capitalist society that uh, decides the kind of relations that exist between uh, or among the people while involving in production so from here so that means that different people occupy different positions especially in class divided societies so there it is from there that you can decipher what you mean by class so you have certain passages from uh, marxist literature uh, in uh, from Ma marx himself which will tell you how these relations of production uh, the place that one occupies in the relations of production is uh, uh, leading us to the uh, establishment of classes uh, or understanding of classes so for example i will read out uh, one passage uh, from the 18th brumaire of uh, louis bonaparte uh, where marx says in so far as millions of families live under the conditions of existence that separate their mode of life their interests and their culture from those of other classes and put them in hostile opposition to the latter they form a class so here he is telling okay, that in the mode of production especially in the class divided societies uh, uh, the relations of production takes antagonistic uh, uh, takes the form of antagonistic relations uh, where one group of people is uh, counterposed it is uh, they are in antagonistic relation to another group of people hmm? as in slave society there are slave lords on the one side slaves on the other side feudal society feudal lords are on one side and the serfs 
or on the other side like that so here based on the position that uh, one takes uh, everything okay? so their interest their culture also differs eh? and they will be actually in antagonistic relations uh, with uh, each other that is what he is telling eh? and that actually makes us understand what you mean by class so uh, Marx in another uh, classic work the German ideology he says the separate individuals form a class in so far as they have to carry carry on a common battle against another class otherwise they are on hostile terms with each other as competitors. This is another thing which I was telling you in my last lecture. When you say classes, the classes are always in relation to other classes. Hmm? So, yeah, they are so, uh, many times in antagonistic relationship with other classes. When you say class, there can't be just one class. Or when you say classes, you cannot say, oh, that class is also there, this class is there, and both of them are going together without uh, any kind of contradictions. No. When there are classes, there is bound to be contradiction, and they are competing with uh, one another, and many times they are hostile to one another, especially when it comes to major classes. Okay? Now you see, based on these uh, uh, passages uh, from Marx and Engels, uh, uh, it was uh, Lenin who tried to give a precise definition of a class. Uh, the two, uh, you know, he wrote about state and revolution, where also he emphasized on classes and class struggle and revolution. But uh, this definition of class uh, he gave in a, a lecture which is now titled as Great Beginning. And this was given in 1990. Hmm? So here in this pamphlet, uh, uh, Lenin writes, uh, he defines uh, classes like this. Classes are large groups of people differing from each other by the place they occupy in a historically determined system of social production, by their relation, in most cases fixed and formulated in law, to the means of production, by their role in the social organization of labor, and consequently by the dimension of uh, the share of social wealth of which they dispose and the mode of acquiring it. See, this is a very comprehensive definition where he brings in different elements. Uh, of course, primarily he is emphasizing uh, that classes are to be located in the mode of production on that basis you determine the, uh, the uh, nature of the classes so here he's telling uh, what all I saw, uh, told you in the last class it is determined on the basis of your relation to the means of production that means whether you own land, whether you own factory, or whether you have a cottage industry. Mm -hmm. This matters, I uh, think. Uh, it depends. Or you are working under somebody uh, as a serf or as a mm, uh, worker. Mm -hmm. So, and that you don't have any property at all. So, this is uh, the relation to property, one thing and the kind of uh, role that you play in uh, 
uh, this social organization of protection. Uh, so uh, think yeah, whether and what is that you get out of it? How do you get your means of livelihood? Hmm? Do you get uh, in the form of rent or in the form of profit or as a uh, uh, wage? Hmm? So in what forms you get uh, uh, the livelihood uh, and how you uh, make use of that? Uh, uh, how uh, uh, you actually uh, make use of that in this, uh, uh, in what you say, uh, in reproducing uh, your own lives so all these things matter a lot in understanding the concept of classes then from this theoretical issues i told you that the classes do exist in all kinds of societies which came into existence after the establishment of the institution of private property. It's a different matter that the classes or the class struggles took different forms. But everywhere I told you that the dominant property class, economically dominant property class also becomes a dominant political class or a ruling class and that is mediated through the institution called state. So much so that the state becomes a class state in all class divided societies and that is true even of the capitalist society. So actually the Communist Manifesto gives a very beautiful, concise understanding of how the bourgeoisie as well as the proletariat evolved as classes in capitalist society. I read a passage now from the Communist Manifesto where Marx and Engels write about uh, the bourgeoisie. Here it goes. Each step in the development of the bourgeoisie was accompanied by a corresponding political advance of that class. Since the establishment of a modern industry and of the world market, the bourgeoisie, the con conquered for itself in the modern representative state, ex exclusive political sway. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. So in this he is telling how as the bourgeoisie started acquiring wealth hmm, gradually from the mercantile stage to industrial uh, revolution. So they started uh, becoming economically dominant. But simultaneously, they also became politically dominant. But with the help of the state, they emerged as the ruling class and they held their political sway over the entire society. So it is in that context, he tells about the state where he says that this executive of the modern state is nothing but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. So there he is telling the state in capitalist society is nothing but a capitalist state. 
Now we uh, look at uh, uh, the bourgeoisie. You know, this is the bourgeoisie, uh, sorry, the proletariat. The proletariat emerged also along with the bourgeoisie. Eh? So I told you how uh, the, uh, alongside uh, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat also started uh, uh, emerging uh, as a class in course of time. But I told you that it is not that the proletariat uh, uh, becomes politically conscious uh, uh, in the very beginning, but gradually uh, through its own experience uh, that it tries to organize itself uh, and then understands uh, its own uh, revolutionary potential uh, and its own uh, uh, the t uh, task in uh, the given system of production uh, and uh, tries to uh, get out of uh, uh, the uh, uh, slavery of uh, capital uh, by organizing itself and by leading the revolution against uh, capital state. So it is in that uh, I think uh, talking about the significance of uh, uh, the proletariat uh, Marx and Engels write uh, this beautiful passage uh, in uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto. This is what they say. The proletarians cannot become masters of the productive forces of society except by abolishing their own previous mode of appropriation and thereby also every other previous mode of appropriation. They have nothing of their own to secure and to fortify. Their mission is to destroy all previous securities for and insurances of individual property. All previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interests of the minorities. The proletarian movement is the self-conscious, independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of an immense majority. See, in this passage, Marx and Engels are actually telling how the proletariat movement is different from other bourgeois revolutions or bourgeois revolutions that took place uh, uh, before. And it also, oh, the passage also tells uh, why Marx and Engels considered the proletariat as uh, the only revolutionary class. You know, I told you that all other classes there are other classes, I told you. There is peasantry, there is uh, artisan class, there is also petty bourgeois who have their own grievances against capitalism and fight against capitalism at some level. But why do they fight? I told you. They fight to revive or to uh, retain what little property that they have. But the proletariat is different. They are not fighting to retain property. Rather, they are there to destroy all forms of property. They are fighting not only against the capitalist mode of production, but against all other kinds of uh, uh, modes of production that existed earlier based on 
the institution of private property. So the interest of the proletariat lies in wiping of all forms of private property. It is for that reason that Marx and Engels do consider the proletariat as the most revolutionary class. Okay, now I will come to another passage. That is what uh, drives us. Yes, the proletariat uh, fights against the capitalist uh, uh, state and captures that uh, state power. And after that, what does it do? Hmm? There I told you that Marx say that after capturing the state power, the proletariat should destroy the existing capitalist state and in its place establish a proletarian state which they call as dictatorship of the proletariat. There are many who consider that this idea of dictatorship of the proletariat is actually uh, goes to Lenin and nothing of that sort is said by Marx and Engels. But I show you uh, one passage from uh, Marx's letter to his friend Weidemir written as early as in 1852 where he says this no credit is due to me for discovering the existence of classes in modern society or the struggle between them. Long before me, bourgeois historians had described the historical development of this class struggle. And Bourgeois economies, the economic anatomy of classes. What I did was new, what I did that was new was to prove one, that the classes, that the existence of classes is only bound up with the particular historical phases in the development of uh, production. Second, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And third, that this dictatorship itself only constitutes the transition to the abolition of all classes and to a classless society. This is a very interesting ch chapter. You know, here, uh, as I told you uh, when I started uh, the previous lecture, the first part of my lecture, that people consider that uh, classes and class struggles are, uh, are discovered by Marx. It is not so. Here Marx is telling, don't give me any credit for that. I am not the one who, in, who discovered that there are classes and class struggles in the society. Bourgeois historians and bourgeois economists have already done that job. Then what is that new thing that I have done? He says, if you are to give me credit, you give me credit for these three things. One, for saying that the classes are products of history. That means they came at a particular point of time in history. 
and they changed as the history advanced different in different historical phases you have different kinds of classes and class struggle that is the first one and what is the other thing that Marx said he discovered that these class struggles inevitably leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat so ultimately uh, as the class struggles proceed that results in the proletariat establishing its own state or what you, he says dictatorship of the proletariat and why this dictatorship there he says that is my discovery the third one where he says that this dictatorship alone constitutes the transition from capitalism to communism where or what he says to that stage where all classes are abolished so this is what he is telling so in that sense though it is a fact that the concept of dictatorship of the proletariat is subsequently developed and elaborated by Lenin and Stalin, they have their roots in what Marx and Engels have said. Of course, I have read out some other passages uh, related to dictatorship of the proletariat uh, in uh, my lecture on uh, state and revolution also part two of my lecture on state and revolution which you can refer to. Now, uh, but it is goes without saying that uh, this idea was subsequently developed and elaborated uh, by Lenin. Where uh, he says that don't think that uh, with the establishment of uh, Mm, proletariat uh, dictatorship uh, immediately the classes and class struggles disappear uh, rather uh, this phase itself is a, a very violent phase uh, and this is what uh, Lenin in his uh, work left wing chauvinism and infantile disorder he says, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a most determined and most ruthless war waged by the new class against a more powerful enemy, the bourgeoisie, whose resistance is increased tenfold by its overthrow by its overthrow now i'll read another passage from lenin's war the proletarian revolution and renegade kotsky where he says the transition from capitalism to communism represents an entire historical epoch until this epoch has terminated the exploiters inevitably cherish the hope hope of a restoration and this hope is converted into attempts at restoration And these two passages uh, will tell us uh, why Lenin emphasized uh, on a very strong proletarian state. He says that uh, it is uh, possible that uh, at a point of time the proletariat overwhelms uh, uh, its uh, 
adversary, the bourgeoisie, and comes to power. But that doesn't mean that the, the bourgeoisie have disappeared. Bourgeoisie is defeated, but it did not disappear. And the defeated bourgeoisie will make all out efforts to re reorganize itself and fight against uh, the proletariat and overthrow them power from power and come back to uh, uh, power by establishing the capitalist dictatorship. So they continue to make such attempts. And precisely the dictatorship of the proletariat is there to null all these kinds of attempts at restoration of uh, capitalism. Hmm? This is what these passages uh, say. And reiterating that point, uh, Joseph Stalin in his book, uh, uh, Work, The Problems of Leninism, he says, the seizure of power is only the beginning. For many reasons, the bourgeoisie that is overthrown in one country remains for a long time stronger than the proletariat which has overthrown it. Therefore, the whole point is to retain power, to consolidate it, to make it invincible. So he says uh, that it is now in the present stage of uh, proletarian revolution, imperialism and proletarian revolution. It is difficult to have uh, revolutions in all countries simultaneously. So it starts with some countries taking the lead. In such circumstances, even though the bourgeoisie is overthrown in a particular country, they still have a lot of power. Uh, they still retain so much of a capacity. Eh? to gain back, not to come back to power. So they will be making efforts to come back. It is for that reason that uh, you cannot neglect uh, uh, the proletarian state. Uh, you can, uh, the proletarian state uh, cannot uh, remain complacent. Rather, it is the duty of the proletariat to ensure that uh, you retain that state power, consolidate it further and make it invincible so that the bourgeoisie is defeated uh, uh, completely. Hmm? So that is uh, uh, what he is telling. And of course, what are the tasks? Uh, this is uh, another thing. Why is it defeating uh, the bourgeoisie is one of the important task of uh, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat, no doubt about it, eh? but uh, uh, there are other things also. Eh? That is, that this space lay, uh, lays down the foundation for a future communist society. So here uh, there is one passage from State uh, Stalin's The Problems of Leninism, which uh, uh, will be, uh, indicate three important tasks uh, which uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is supposed to accomplish. The first one, to break the resistance of the landlords and capitalists who have been overthrown and expropriated by the revolution to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital. This is one which we have already discussed. The second one, to organize construction in such a way 
as to rally all the working people around the proletariat and to carry on this work along the lines of preparing for the elimination, the abolition of classes. And third one, to arm the revolution, to organize the army of the revolution for the struggle against foreign enemies, for the struggle against imperialism. See, he sets uh, three objectives. The first one, yes, that is uh, to defeat and eliminate uh, the ruling classes in the countries uh, where the proletariat came to power. Hmm? But it, it is not just that. Simultaneously, he tells uh, that uh, during this transitionary period, period that the proletariat should rally behind them all other working people eh, and lay down the foundation for uh, uh, future socialist uh, or communist society which will eliminate uh, all classes eh, in a faced manner and the third one he tells uh, uh, this is also important where he understands uh, uh, that uh, it is not necessary, it is not uh, that uh, in one country the proletariat has come to power and established a, a socialist economy up to a particular stage so you can dissolve the state. No, it is not possible because in all other countries still there are uh, capitalists and imperialists uh, having hold over the economy eh, and the world at large. So the task of the proletarian revolution is to engage in conflict eh, with the imperialists. So you can, the imperialists will not keep quiet and uh, they will make all attempts to suppress the revolution as we have seen in Russia. But uh, so the proletariat state should be ready to stop them. Eh? Checkmate eh, the imperialist eh, ventures eh, or eh, adventures or attempts eh? and make all out efforts to corner them eh, by encouraging the proletarian revolutions eh, in other parts of the world as well. So this is the duty which needs need to be accomplished uh, during the dictatorship of the proletariat. But can this duty, entire thing, whether it is revolution or the complex process of uh, uh, socialist reconstruction after the revolution all these things uh, can be done by the proletariat uh, uh, on their own there I told you that it is not so the proletariat Lenin's believed that it needs a revolutionary party revolutionary party which uh, educates them, organize them and mobilize them and lead them in their struggle uh, for socialism before revolution and also after revolution. So they emphasize so much on the party and this, is, this party is necessary uh, not just up to uh, the stage of uh, uh, proletariat capturing the state power and the party becomes necessary even after the proletariat captures the power it should be able to guide uh, guide uh, the proletariat in all these three tasks uh, which are to be accomplished during the dictatorship of the proletariat so it is what uh, uh, Stalin tells uh, in the problems of uh, Leninism. 
the proletariat needs the party not only to achieve the dictatorship it needs it still more to maintain the dictatorship to to consolidate and expand it in order to achieve the complete victory of uh, socialism so this is uh, the thing so it is only to the extent uh, that there is a revolutionary party which continues to be revolutionary even after the revolution and continue to exercise uh, its uh, hold over the proletariat and other laboring masses that it becomes possible to move towards communism i think so here now i come to the last part of uh, uh, this uh, where uh, lecture where basically marx does summarize that entire uh, discussion that we have made uh, in uh, uh, in a small passage uh, from the from his own work called uh, the class struggle in france 1848 and 1850 so in this uh, uh, he tells this socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution the class dictatorship of the proletariat as the necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally to the abolition of all class relations of production on which they rest to the abolition of all the social relations that correspond to these relations of uh, production to the revolutionizing of uh, all ideas that result from these social relations see in this passage also now you see uh, you can see uh, there are some people who uh, criticize lenin for saying uh, that dictatorship of the proletariat and socialism are similar right? but in this passage you can see that even marx uses this word socialism this socialism is the declaration of the permanence of revolution the class dictatorship of the proletariat so socialism goes with the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, i think it in a sense socialism uh, is somewhat similar to uh, what Marx would call it as dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, and why this dictatorship of the proletariat necessary? As I, he is emphasizing, it is necessary to abolish uh, all class distinctions. So when he is telling this, uh, he is not just talking about uh, uh, economic relations. Yes, not of class, uh, economic relations, but also all other kinds of relations, social, political and ideological relations uh, that go with these uh, class relations. And that is what uh, need to be abolished. Hmm? So that is what he says, abolition of all social relations that correspond to these relations of production and to revolutionizing of uh, the ideas. Uh, so you need to uh, come out with a revolutionary consciousness. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, task that the dictatorship of the proletariat is uh, expected to accomplish. Uh, uh, during this transitionary phase so it is here again the, I read out uh, emphasizing on the same point uh, Lenin also says uh, uh, that 
it is necessary to change not only the capitalist relations of production but also all other forms of relations of production which are not compatible with the socialist relations of production or, or what we can say socialist uh, consciousness. Hmm? So I uh, told you in the last uh, class that it is it is not that classes disappeared by suppressing the capitalists or landlords. Even after suppression of the capitalists and landlords, still there are classes. As I told you, the peasantry, the middle, the petty bourgeoisie, artisans, they will be there. And so the task of a proletarian revolution is uh, not over only with the capture, I mean with the suppression of uh, the exploiters. You need to deal with uh, your own allies also uh, and gradually lead them uh, towards uh, socialism. And that is something which is beautifully uh, written, uh, explained uh, in uh, Lenin's work, left-wing communism and infantile disorder. It is what he says. The abolition of classes means not only driving out the landlords and capitalists, that we accomplish with comparative ease. It also means abolishing the small commodity producers and they cannot be driven out or crushed. We must live in harmony with them. They can and must be remolded and re-educated only by very prolonged, slow, cautious, organizational work. See, this is a very important passage where he is making a distinction in the way that the proletariat or the party or the proletarian state should deal with the different classes within the uh, socialist society or during this uh, intermediary phase called dictatorship of the proletariat where he is saying that yes when it comes to landlords and the capitalists you put them down suppress mercilessly if necessary through military but that is not the end still there are other classes there are small scale producers small peasants, artisans, petty shop uh, uh, owners, petty bourgeoisie. Eh? And you cannot take away their property forcefully. They are your allies, your friends. So you have to carry them along with you. Gradually, slowly, by educating them, by remolding them uh, and then uh, uh, leading them uh, gradually. That leads, uh, that needs so much of patience, so much of uh, organizational effort, uh, something which cannot be done uh, within a uh, few years. And this phase is very important. And this space is important. And if in this space the proletarian state or the party fails, there is every opportunity eh, for revival of uh, commodity production and afterwards even capitalism. But all these things mean it means that the class struggles 
will not come to an end with the capture of the state power by the proletariat. Class struggles or class contradictions or class existence continue in one or the other forms even after the revolution. Unless the party and the proletariat are conscious of uh, the existence of classes after the establishment of uh, the proletarian state, they will not be in a position to what you can say the reconcile the different kinds of contradictions uh, that take place in uh, the transitionary phase. This I think is uh, the essence of uh, Marxist Leninist theory of uh, classes, class struggle, party and dictatorship of the proletariat. Before I end, I would like to suggest uh, some of the essential readings which may help you to understand the subject better. First of all, I want you to read the first chapter of uh, the Communist Manifesto. The first chapter gives an overview of the class struggle and at the same time talks about the emergence or the evolution of uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat as two antagonistic classes in capitalist society. Then I request you to study Engels uh, a short uh, note titled as The Problems of Communism. In this book, uh, he explains in a question and answer form different things, uh, different queries that we all have. What is proletariat? Was there proletariat before? What is its role? And uh, what has to be accomplished uh, uh, in the socialist revolution and all that uh, uh, in uh, uh, every question uh, is answered uh, uh, in a para uh, but in a, a short para will be there to, uh, to give a precise answer to some of the questions which all of us encounter then i request you to go through Ralph Miliband's book, Marxism and Politics, uh, which I already suggested you for uh, other topics as well. Uh, then I also ca came across recently one essay by Paul Gindrich. Uh, it is titled Marx Theory of Social Class and Class Structure. It's a short essay. You can find it here on internet it gives you the summary of uh, marxist understanding of classes and uh, class struggle and of course there is also tom botmore's book uh, the classes in capitalist societies uh, so these were some of the works of course i am not saying that they are the only works you have many other works um, if you are interested uh, uh, to know more you can explore that as I told you, what all I talk in these lectures is the introductory lectures, which aims to give you a comprehensive understanding of certain topics or issues in Marxist political theory. I hope you enjoyed this class and 
uh, I am sure that you will come back to my next class where I will be talking about uh, some other topic okay, in Marxist political theory. If you like my lectures, I request you to ask your friends to join these classes, ask them to subscribe the channel so that they get to know whenever I upload a new lecture. Thank you very much.